everybody hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Okay, guys, welcome back. Hopefully you had a little bit of a break there. Um, my name's Cam. I'm one of the R3s. I'm talking to you guys today about trans health and specifically about gender affirming surgery in the framework of us as internists and not as surgeons ourselves. Um, uh, if you were here two weeks ago, which I hope that many of you were, you saw a series of amazing talks on trans health from some of my colleagues who are also in the transgender health block. So this will be sort of the, the last blip of that before I set you guys free. Um, as far as my outline and goals today, my hope is to just briefly review gender affirming surgery, some of the terminology, go over some internist friendly level of details um, and discuss the complications in anticipated recovery. And then in addition, sort of my bigger broader goal is to help um, all of us learn to navigate the system for our patients as a primary care provider, both generally and in Seattle. Uh, sadly, big trans is not uh, giving me the million. So I have no disclosures to report. Before I jump in and I start talking about um, gender affirming surgery, I wanted to hit on one thing that is not really gonna be the focus of the talk. And that's about addressing some of these conversations with patients and some of the terminology involved. Um, I wanna talk about it today because I think that this is something that generates a lot of anxiety for folks. Um, most of us are aware that transgender people as members of marginalized community are at risk of medical abuse and have a longstanding history of uh, really troubling interactions in the healthcare setting. And I think that that can actually generate a lot of distress for learners and, and for providers in general when they are interacting with their transgender patients. And that can paradoxically actually make the situation a little bit rougher because when the provider is nervous and the patient gets nervous and that can sort of derail some of the conversations that you'd like to have. So I wanted to say, that um, when you're having some of the conversations with patients about um, their next steps for surgery and about their bodies in general, please do try to avoid prying or asking questions out of curiosity alone. But I, I do empower you to ask questions that are medically relevant. It's appropriate for you to ask a patient, for example, hey, do you have a prostate? Especially if you go on to explain, well, I ask you this because I want to make sure that I'm performing the appropriate uh, cancer screenings for you as my patient. M most patients are going to be able to understand that and feel very comfortable with that question. And that feels very different than being like, hey, what's up with your genitals when they're coming in for respiratory distress? I think most of us understand that distinction, but it, it bears repeating in my opinion. Similarly, um, it's always great if you can use gender neutral or community designated language. And I'll, I'll talk with you a little bit in a second about what that means in this context. Um, but if you're getting into a little bit of a, of a panic there, just remember, be respectful, be kind. Anatomic language is usually perfectly appropriate. And if you have any concerns at all, just ask the patient. Patients deal with this all the time and they're going to be able to share with you what terminology they want to use for their own body. And that's gonna make it a more mutual comfortable situation. So now moving on to the actual part of my talk. Um, some of the community terminology for gender affirming surgery that some of you guys may have heard include things like top and bottom surgery. Um, and so to briefly discuss that top surgery speaking generally is a gender neutral term that it Im addresses any interventions that address the chest. Um, while bottom surgery refers to interventions that address the genitals and reproductive tract. And again, this can be used to people of any gender. Um, some other surgeries uh, that I'll briefly touch on today, um, for transmasculine individuals, that includes um, facial masculinization surgery, which is a form of craniofacial surgery designed to enhance um, more typically masculine features like prominence of the brow or prominence of the chin, um, and a uncommon surgery called relaxation thyroplasty that can lower the voice for patients who have insufficient voice deepening from testosterone alone. Um, I bring those up briefly because they're not going to be the focus of my talk today. Um, and then some other surgeries that don't fall into the top or bottom surgery category for trans feminine individuals include facial feminization surgery, also known as FFS, um, which is exactly as you might anticipate, um, a form of craniofacial surgery that um, helps to enhance more typically feminine aspects of the face, um, tracheal shaving to reduce the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple, and voice feminization surgery to raise the pitch of the voice. And I, I will briefly touch on those a little bit later. So I'm going to start today by talking a little bit about top surgery. 
Um, and I'm going to begin with masculinizing top surgery. When you hear the term top surgery without any further elaboration, this is most likely what you're hearing about. Um, masculinizing top surgery involves the removal of chest or breast tissue. Um, when most of us have encountered patients who have had mastectomies for cancer-related reasons, and so I want to emphasize that this is actually not the same as a cancer-related mastectomy, because obviously in a cancer-related mastectomy, you're worried about things like ensuring that there's no, that, you know, we've got the margins and that the lymph nodes have been explored. And so this tends to be a more invasive surgery um, relative to top surgery, where while it's certainly an essential surgery, the focus of it is on the aesthetics and creating a more masculine chest. Um, so less tissue is removed. Um, there's preservation of the lymph nodes and the nipple as well, unless the patient requests otherwise. And subsequently the recovery time is less and patients don't have some of the downstream consequences that you might associate with <clears throat> with mastectomy, like for example, the risk of lymphedema. Um, there are a couple of common techniques. Um, I won't get into too much detail, but the most common ones are double incision with free nipple grafting and periareolar or keyhole surgery. Um, double incision, which is commonly just known as DI in community, um, more closely resembles the traditional mastectomy. This is when patients have um, bilateral inframammary incisions, the chest tissue is removed, the nipple stalk is severed, the areola is trimmed to um, and resized to make it smaller, and the nipples are grafted into a more anatomically masculine location, um, and then the inframammary incisions are, are stitched up. Um, periareolar, in contrast, involves a circumferential incision around the areola, um, and then liposuction is performed to remove the tissue uh, deep to that. Um, there are no large inframammary incisions, um, and keyhole is a very closely related form of surgery, uh, which is similar except for the circumcisions, uh, excuse me, um, the incisions are not circumferential. Um, they're just a really small keyhole incision. Um, and for that reason, the areola can't be resized. Um, an important thing to note for masculinizing top surgery is that actually testosterone HRT is not required for this procedure. So this can be really important for your patients who either are not able to or interested um, in taking testosterone for whatever reason. For example, a patient who is non-binary and has some hesitations about the masculinizing effects of uh, testosterone, but still is certain that they would like a more flat chest. So I'm gonna show you guys some pictures now. Here are is some examples of double incision. Um, and I, you can see all the person on the left has somewhat fresher incisions than the person on the right. Um, as you can see, after time, the results of the surgery is really usually pretty subtle. Um, unless you're looking closely, most people kind of are not aware of the fact that there has been a surgical intervention, particularly if somebody has a lot of uh, chest hair. Uh, double incision is typically performed on patients who have um, either a larger chest or more pendulous breasts. And um, in this context, for what it's worth, a larger chest means anything larger than um, what we might traditionally think of as like an A cup. Uh, because only very small chests are sort of amenable to the um, to the liposuction technique involved with peri or keyhole, um, and then the sort of issue about pendulous breasts, the the that's a sort of common concern amongst folks who have been binding their chest for many years. It can lead to some skin elasticity changes. So as a result, DI tends to be by far the most common intervention. But here is an example of the appearance of keyhole and periareolar. The person on the left underwent keyhole surgery and the person on the right underwent peri. Um, as you can see, they both had very small chests prior to their surgical interventions. And they have a very sort of cisgender normative uh, masculine appearing chest afterwards without um, any sort of visible scarring. So this can be a really wonderful option for people who want to minimize any scarring who have the appropriate um, body type. Um, top surgery in trans women and trans feminine individuals is essentially the same as breast augmentation that's performed in cisgender women. Um, for this reason, it's more commonly just described as breast augmentation or BA. Um, it involves the placement of breast implants plus minus fat grafting. Um, as with masculinizing top surgery, 
estrogen HRT is not required, but um, it is actually recommended in this case. And that's because um, many surgeons feel that um, the natural chest development that occurs when people are on estrogen um, does sort of aesthetically optimize the results. Um, and so as a result, some insurance companies will be stinkers if your patient has not been on uh, HRT for a full year. But um, I would encourage you to push back on that if that seems like the right next step for the patient, because it is not sort of a guideline directed recommendation at all. And so here are some visual examples of breast augmentation. Um, in both of these sort of before cases, the patient had not as much breast development as you might see. Patients who have estrogen uh, HRT uh, typically do have some uh, breast growth and they can typically be an AA or an A cup or larger depending on their body habits. So um, now I'm going to get into some of the meat and potatoes, so to speak, um, and talk to you guys about bottom surgery. Um, I'm going to start by talking about masculinizing bottom surgery first. And this, um, there's a lot of components to this. It's kind of a complex topic. Um, so hold on and bear with me. Um, briefly, I will touch on hysterectomy and ophorectomy, um, which is performed by pretty much any OBGYN. Um, and it is the exact same techniques that are used in cisgender women. Um, it leads to permanent sensation of menses and the ovaries can be left in situ for fertility preservation in transmasculine individuals. Um, and I will note, just because this is something that we don't encounter commonly in um, cisgender folks, unilateral ophorectomy is not uncommon in this population. So many people will say, I would like to have my uterus out. I would like to have one of my ovaries out and I'll just keep the other one in there as a backup in case I decide I want to have children down the road. So now to talk about uh, gender affirming genital surgery um, and to give you a little bit of context going in, um, for folks who are on testosterone HRT, it's a very common consequence um, and often a desirable consequence for them to undergo something that's known in community as bottom growth. And that's the colloquial term for clitoromegaly. Um, for some patients, the uh, changes that they see from testosterone alone are very affirming and that's sort of sufficient for them to feel comfortable um, with their own you know, personal genitals, but other people might find that um, they still have a lot of gender dysphoria associated with their uh, genitals, and they might desire um, the ability to stand to urinate or to penetrate their partner during sexual intercourse. And for that reason, they may choose to perform, a, uh, to pursue a form of gender affirming genital reconstruction, um, either phalloplasty or metoidoplasty. And I'll talk to you guys a little bit about that. So what is metoidoplasty? I would say that this is probably a surgery that um, many people feel uncomfortable with or unfamiliar with, um, but it is a increasingly common technique for uh, gender affirming genital surgery. Um, metoidoplasty, which is also known as meta, uses transmasculine individuals natural bottom growth or clitoromegaly um, in the creation of a neophallus that closely resembles a cisgender man's micropenis. So uh, the techniques here are essentially that the clitoral suspensory ligaments are severed, which allows for greater extension or movement of, um, of the clitoris or phallus and maximizes the size of the neophallus. Some people might choose to undergo a procedure that's called simple meta. And what that is, is just all they do is ha have some snipping of those suspensatory ligaments to maximize their external genitalia size. Um, and then they say, okay, done. Um, but in full meta, which is probably the more common intervention, um, there is also a component where uh, the patient undergoes a vaginectomy and urethral lengthening and a scrotoplasty. So what that means is that the vaginal mucosa is actually removed and the vaginal vault is closed. Um, a neourethra is created using the labia minora and extended to the glands of the neophallus. Um, and just as an aside, when you see patients who have undergone this procedure, it's very common for patients to have a deliberate and very mild hypospadias because uh, this can actually, for reasons that I don't fully understand, reduce urinary complications. Um, and then finally, the scrotum is created using the labia majora. This can be a multi-stage procedure and typically a patients are going to undergo testicular implants as you might think of for a person who has had, for example, an orchiectomy for cancer related reasons. Um, if, they, if they do choose to pursue that, those are typically placed at a later time. 
So uh, here are some images of patients who have undergone toygeplasty. You can see a patient who is in a preoperative state on the far left, and then some close-ups of their postoperative appearance on the right. Um, and then I'm going to show you now a zoomed out image uh, demonstrating sort of a, a more full body shot so that you can see um, what the results typically look like. Um, metoidoplasty is a procedure that tends to be very effective in patients who have more prominence of their own natural phallus um, and also those who have a more slender body habitus because just with cis gender men, uh, people who are a little bit more heavy set um, and have some more abdominal girth um, might have sort of essentially retraction or might have spillage over the top of their own uh, genitals that might make the external appearance less prominent. Cam, there is a mm -hmm. question in the chat. Um, yes. It's a, I assume that the cervix is removed either as part of the hysterectomy or vaginal vault closure. Yes, you're correct, Hillary. Most, almost everyone, and in fact, I would go so far as to say every, everybody, I think it's a preoperative requirement for those who are undergoing a vaginectomy will have to have a hysterectomy. So um, they do not have a cervix at this point. And by the way, guys, I, like I mentioned kind of at the start, I'm not really talking about terminology today, uh, but if people have questions like they're scratching their heads and saying like, why didn't Cam explain this? Or there's something that I don't feel clarity about, please put it in the chat and I'm very happy to, to pause. I know this isn't um, something that has, that everybody has had the opportunity to review. N now to talk a little bit about phalloplasty. Uh, phalloplasty is another form of masculinizing, gender affirming genital surgery. Um, it's a really pretty complex multi-step procedure um, that involves the creation of, of what I would describe as a more cis-normative phallus um, using a distant donor site for tissue. So there's a lot of different donor sites that can be utilized here. Um, and I won't get into too much detail because this is not something that you as a internist would ever have to determine with your patient. But it, it can be helpful to know a little bit um, for these patients, both pre and post-operatively. Um, some of the sites that are sometimes used uh, for these flaps is the radial forearm, the anterolateral thigh, the back, or the abdomen. Um, and each technique has some different pros and cons. For example, in patients who undergo the radial free forearm flap technique, um, these patients usually have an excellent aesthetic appearance of their uh, resulting phallus. And because sensory nerves are, are harvested, um, they tend to have very good inner innervation uh, sensory innervation of their phallus and can have good um, sensation and erectile sensation throughout. Um, but as a con, um, because their forearm is used, these patients tend to have a large visible scar on their forearm and they're at risk of pain and functional loss of their arm, which can sometimes obviously have pretty significantly deleterious effects. So for some patients, they may feel that that's an unacceptable risk for them. Patients who choose to undergo the thigh flap um, will have less visible scarring because obviously it's on their leg rather than on their arm. But this technique has actually very firm BMI limits, which might limit their um, the accessibility for certain patients. And this is because the subcutaneous tissue from the thigh is involved in the flap. And so patients who have larger body habitus or who, who for whatever reason just carry a little bit more weight on their thighs will have an increased girth of their phallus. And that might uh, lead to a less uh, less optimal result in, in the patient or provider's eyes, depending on their priorities. Um, patients who undergo the musculocutaneous latissimus dorsi flap or the back flap um, also have really minimal visible scarring. Um, and uh, this technique is a little bit different than the previous two techniques and can have some pluses and minuses because um, in this technique, rather than harvesting primarily sensory nerves, it's actually motor nerves that are harvested. Um, I, there was a question about this a couple of weeks ago during some of the other uh, uh, trans health talks, but in patients who undergo MLD um, or back flap phalloplasty, they can actually have um, unassisted erections. And by unassisted erections, I mean that they do not need to have the placement of a erectile device like a pump or a rod. And that can obviously be very wonderful and affirming for some patients. Um, however, the flip side of that is that they have less sensation, less erotic sensation, and, and their phallus can actually be insensate. Um, and that might be an unacceptable trade-off for the patient. 
Um, I, abdominal or pedicled flap phalloplasty is an emerging technique. I would say that I have seen in the last, you know, reach prominence in the last year or so. And so I have a little bit less information about that, but it's something that hopefully we will learn more about in the upcoming couple of years. Um, all forms of phalloplasty, regardless of technique, are typically performed as a multi-stage procedure. Uh, the second stage is usually uh, nine to 12 months later. I would say that a year later is the most common. Um, as with metoidoplasty, scrotal implants are placed usually at the second step. Um, and if patients choose to have an erectile device placed, that's typically done at the second step as well. Uh, the techniques for vaginectomy, scrotoplasty, and urethroplasty are very similar to those used in metoidoplasty. However, I will say as a caveat, patients who undergo phalloplasty do not typically have hypospadias. They, they, their urethra exits at the head of the meatus, just as with a typical cisgender phallus. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that the patient's own natal tissue can be addressed here. Um, it can either be buried within the neophallus um, if patients undergo either um, the forearm or the leg flap uh, phalloplasty, um, because in those patients, they undergo essentially nerve hookup so that um, that sensation that they feel in their natal tissue um, can be sort of appreciated throughout the neophallus. Um, for those who don't wish to have that form of a procedure or who have concerns about sensory loss, they might choose to have their um, their flap placed just superior to their natal tissue um, so that they can still have direct stimulation of their tissue during intercourse. Um, an important thing to note, and I will discuss the details of this later, is that hair from donor sites must be removed preoperatively, otherwise patients will have hair on their phallus, which is typically considered to be a less aesthetically optimal result. Um, and many patients do choose to undergo medical tattooing to further enhance the cosmetic appearance. Um, and I will just briefly mention again that BMI requirements are very variable for this, and some surgeons have very strict BMI requirements, typically less than a BMI of 30 for any form of phalloplasty, and it can be significantly less than that for patients who undergo um, anterolateral thigh phalloplasty. Here is uh, um, some photos of some very well healed. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Let me go back so you can see the scarring. Well healed um, scars on this is the on the left and in the center, uh, the radial forearm, um, and then there's the interlateral thigh. Uh, these photos have occurred several years post-operatively, and as you can see, the aesthetic result is really pretty good, but um, still visible scarring there. Um, and so for patients who are very concerned about um, the appearance of their donor sites, uh, this is something for them to be aware of. And then next you'll see um, a post-operative phallus. Uh, the, these photos were taken at the time of erectile device placement, as you can kind of see on the left. Um, and as you can see, it, it's a, a very sort of cisgender normative uh, size of the phallus relative to a metoidoplasty procedure. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some complications. This is certainly not something that you're going to be responsible for counseling your patient on as a primary care provider, but it can be helpful for when your patient inevitably returns to your office uh, with a discharge summary that just says defer to PCP. Um, so uh, most uh, post-operative complications for folks who undergo masculinizing uh, bottom surgery actually occur in the acute setting. There are short-term consequences rather than long-term consequences. So I've broken this up today into really kind of the the common and the less severe consequences versus the, the more emergent consequences. So um, it's rather common and, and typically not too severe for people to have localized wound infections. These can be bacterial or fungal. They're treated with um, either PO or topical antibiotics and tend to resolve quite quickly. Systemic infection is rare. Um, it's common for people to have a little bit of wound hissence or fistula formation. This is almost always managed conservatively, but um, I flag it for you because it's helpful for the surgeon to be aware of it in case some kind of operative repair, repair is required. Um, usually patients are very well linked in with their surgeons um, and can you know, know to reach out to, to their surgeons when this occurs. Um, but in case somebody ends up in your office, that's something that you would sort of flag for, uh, for them to return to their surgery, which to discuss. Um, 
uh, UTI is not uncommon just because they've had all of this manipulation of their neourethra. Um, but I will again flag for people that pyuria is very common. And so as you guys all know, because you are experts in UTI management, um, if you just happen to catch pyuria on a, on a UA for whatever reason, um, don't panic. <laughs> um, not that you would anyway. Um, but uh, that's sort of common guidelines from, um, from the surgeons. Uh, as far as how long the pyuria lasts, I don't know, but I think it's expected on the order of a few weeks. Um, urethral strictures, ooh, my slides are being funky. Urethral strictures are not uncommon um, and patients might have to have a full catheter placed uh, as a result. Um, Hypertrophic scarring is unfortunately a consequence of any surgery. Patients might have, have small hematomas and then like downstream problems with their catheter are also quite common. Patients who undergo masculinizing bottom surgery have to have a super pubic catheter for three to four weeks, which is pretty significant. And so that brings us back to, of course, concern for UTI as well. Um, so uh, it's not uncommon for patients to return to their primary care provider and say, oh, I'm having discomfort or my catheter isn't working properly, I don't have good flushing or flow. And so those issues are commonly sort of troubleshot in the PCP arena. As far as severe complications go, obviously major infections, major bleeding, um, that would not make anyone feel good. And those are risks of um, any significant surgery. Um, but the two things really that I want to emphasize here are rectal injury and flap loss. Um, uh, the reasons why I want to talk about rectal injury is because this can present a little bit more subacutely and can have a um, more subtle presentation. Um, when patients are undergoing vaginectomy, they're at risk of having injury to the um, to the rectum due to like shearing or laceration um, when the uh, vaginal vault is being closed. Um, and so these patients that can be sort of noticed immediately and repaired intraoperatively, but if it's not appreciated at the time, they might present to their PCP uh, with complications on the order from fever chills, a little bit of malaise, all the way over to like overt sepsis. Um, and so you should have a, a sort of high index of suspicion for this in your immediately post-op patient who comes back into you um, feeling unwell. Um, Obviously, if patients have stool from their scrotum or the base of their penis, that demonstrates a very significant fistula, and that's um, not good. And so I would counsel you guys to, to redirect those folks to the ED right away. Um, and I'll let you know that um, abdominal pain and peritoneal signs are very rare just because the rectum is extra peritoneal. And, and these patients do need admission because they oftentimes have to undergo diverting colostomy. Um, uh, Flap loss is another complication. This is a really tricky one. Obviously, it only occurs in patients who have undergone phalloplasty because there's no flap um, in metoidioplasty. Uh, patients who have flap loss that can sometimes be salvaged if surgery occurs within hours. Um, this is just a really lousy complication because not to um, jump ahead in my slides, but there are no providers who perform a masculinizing bottom surgery in the state of Washington. So the chances of this being sort of caught within hours are um, less likely if the patient has returned home to the state of Washington immediately postoperatively. That's why most surgeons will choose to have their patients remain local um, in the postoperative setting for the, a week or so. Um, however, if this does occur for whatever reason, uh, these people need to be directed to the hospital right away. Um, hopefully they can um, have uh, an operative intervention with a reconstructive urologist um, and the flap can be salvaged. One thing that we can do as primary care doctors to help um, mitigate this risk is if you know that your patient has um, thrombotic risk factors, um, please make sure that you emphasize to the patient and maybe even directly to the surgeon about this risk. Um, and I saw in the chat there uh, just a question about feminizing top surgery. Do patients usually get tissue expanders first? This is variable and dependent on the surgeons. They do not always have um, tissue expanders placed. And I would say more commonly than not, they do not. Um, and I did not really talk too much about the complications of uh, top surgery. And that's, I will just say, because they are typically very minimal, um, other than the usual sort of bleeding and infection risk that can come with any operative in, uh, intervention, um, the complications are largely aesthetic and related to scarring. Okay, 
So everybody take a deep breath. We got through the uh, masculinizing bottom surgery, which is a pretty big topic. And now I'm gonna talk about feminizing bottom surgery, um, which is a little bit uh, less complex. Um, so uh, for trans feminine individuals, um, Unlike with testosterone, which causes sort of very significant changes in the external genitalia, estrogen HRT um, does cause a decrease in the size of the testes, but typically does not have a significant effect on the size of the phallus. So um, regardless for patients who feel that they're, um, that this leads to gender dysphoria for them, they might choose to undergo uh, this feminizing bottom surgery. And, and there's typically two components. Uh, one is very common and that's orchiectomy. And the other is also common, but um, slightly less so, and that's vaginoplasty. Um, orchiectomy is something that probably you've all have encountered at some point in your cisgender patients. Um, it's the surgical removal of the testes. Um, the operative procedure is much like those who choose or need to undergo orchiectomy for say cancer related reasons. It's an outpatient low risk procedure. Um, patients can typically return to work within a few days and it doesn't impact their future bottom surgery options. Um, although technically um, preoperative HRT is not a requirement, um, most patients will have been on HRT for a considerable period of time before they undergo orchiectomy. Um, if just because Otherwise it creates like this hormone whiplash that can be uncomfortable for folks. Um, and the one thing that I will flag for you guys um, is that our big important thing to remember is that um, many of these patients preoperatively will be on testosterone blockers like spironolactone. And obviously if they're not making their own endogenous testosterone that can be stopped postoperatively. Um, so usually the surgeons will remember this. Usually the patients themselves will also remember this, um, but we should have it in our minds as well that um, they no longer need to be on any sort of testosterone blocker post orchiectomy. Um, and I will give you guys just a little bit of a historical fun fact. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, if you go back, you know, 20 years ago, many, we, orchiectomy now is much more accessible for our transgender patients, but um, I have heard from a reliable source, which was a patient who underwent this procedure, um, that many transgender orchiectomies were performed in a shed by a surgical resident um, at times when, um, when orchiectomy was not as accessible to our transgender patients. So I mentioned this just as a, so that we can all take a beat and think about how far we've come in terms of accessibility and hope that things continue to improve as time goes on. Yeah, I know it's really shocking, um, but, but true. So I uh, want to talk to you guys now about vaginoplasty. Um, vaginoplasty is, as you guys have probably anticipated, the surgical creation of the vaginal canal and vulva. Um, this is sometimes a two-step procedure. In fact, I'll go so far as to say that it's almost always a two-step procedure, although some surgeons will perform it in a single step. Um, typically what happens is that patients undergo vaginoplasty and sort of the initial creation of a labia, and then they undergo a second step of labiaplasty to sort of um, aesthetically optimize the results. Um, there are a few techniques that are involved here. Um, an older technique involved um, some harvesting of the rectal mucosa to be used, um, and sorry, not the rectal mucosa, rather the colonic mucosa to be used in the creation of the uh, vaginal canal. Um, and that was nice because it was mucosal tissue, but um, it, it's fallen out of favor a little bit as a technique because um, as you might imagine, that tissue is very highly secretory. And um, so patients oftentimes have large amounts of sort of discharge that was uncomfortable for them to deal with or annoying for them to deal with and necessitated wearing like a panty liner at all times. Um, so the more common technique these days, oh, and also obviously any form of abdominal surgery is a little bit more risky. Um, so the most common technique these days is a variation of um, what sort of colloquially known as penile inversion. Um, so what happens here is that patients um, undergo the creation of a vaginal vault. The typical depth here is, is 12 to 16 centimeters, and that's a little bit larger than a um, typical cisgender woman's um, or transmasculine person's um, vaginal vault. And that's uh, because there's less flexibility in terms of the like ability for the vaginal vault to sort of dilate. Um, it's a fixed size. Um, the penile skin is used as um, vaginal lining and the labia majora um, are created using scrotal skin. The clitoris is made using a portion of the gland's penis and 
as an important heads up, the prostate is typically left in situ because this leads to decreased urinary complications and increased opportunity for erogenous zones. It's sort of left as the analog to the, to the so-called G-spot. Um, some important consequences to be aware of um, is that uh, dilation is required. The patients must manually dilate their uh, vaginal vault postoperatively, and I'll talk with you guys a little bit more about that later. Um, because penile skin is used, and this is not mucosal tissue, it's squamous cell tissue, um, it is not uh, self-cleaning and does not lubricate on its own. Um, there's a lot of uh, preoperative hair removal that's required. Um, and finally, the, the other thing that I'll flag for you, and again, I'll review all this stuff in a moment, is that um, because the prostate is left inside to prostate cancer lift, uh, um, risk obviously remains. So here is some images of uh, a postoperative um, vulva. Uh, these are two different patients that you can see. One's postoperative results on the left, and then on the right, there's just two shots of their postoperative appearance. Um, as with uh, all people who have vaginas and vulvas, there's a lot of variability in terms of the like appearance of the postoperative vulva um, and the prominence of the clitoris and that sort of thing. Um, and so one thing that can be helpful is to remind patients that, that this is something that is extremely variable in all people and that there's no sort of one ideal aesthetic result. Um, and I'll discuss hair removal in just a moment. Um, as far as complications go, um, I know that this is a little bit confusing because I broke up the transmasculine bottom surgery into sort of um, less severe and more severe, but because uh, uh, transfeminine bot bottom surgery can have delayed complications. I have actually instead broken it up into early and late. And so I apologize if that's a little bit disorienting. Um, but um, some early complications for patients who undergo uh, vaginoplasty is bleeding from the urethra, is infection. Um, Clitoral necrosis is a very scary sounding complication, um, but this is actually not uncommon. It's typically managed with just topical antibiotics and effective management. Um, and the reason why it's not as scary as it sounds is because actual sensory loss is very rare. Um, so even though most people might have some like externally um, unpleasant looking tissue for a couple of weeks, typically they will go on to have a very sort of normal and functional result. Um, there can, as with um, uh, with metrogeplasty and phalloplasty, there can be some separation of the suture line and maybe a little bit of a fistula. Um, the important thing to counsel patients on here, um, and surgeons will hammer this home or should hammer this home, is that they should not stop dilating just because this occurs. It's very normal to see a little bit of separation and think, oh my gosh, I don't want to touch it. Um, but in fact, in these patients, the risk of a vaginal stenosis is actually greater than the risk of clinically significant dehiscence. Um, urinary retention is not uncommon as well in the uh, immediate post-operative setting and is typically treated with tamsulosin. Um, and a slightly more, not slightly, but actually considerably more con uh, significant early complication is sloughing of the vaginal lining. A little bit of discharge is normal. Um, however, some patients might come into the office and say, hey, I have had a large amount of tissue that I seem to be passed, passing vaginally. Um, and that's concerning because these patients need to um, typically have uh, a second graft placed. And so um, if patients have large volume, um, sort of sloughing of their vaginal lining, they, the surgeon should be alerted. Um, some late complications, and um, these are, are sort of worth knowing about because um, sometimes uh, some communication is missed, I think, in terms of um, knowing what to expect postoperatively, but um, if folks can under have some vaginal stenosis, as I mentioned, loss of vaginal depth, vaginismus, and this typically occurs because, um, and because either there was sort of insufficient dilating or just because the patient is unlucky and not because they did anything wrong, of course. Um, but this can be, make you know, intercourse or other forms of sexual activity very uncomfortable for patients. And so the surgeon should be alerted because they might need to have um, a surgical revision to allow for um, for greater, for greater depth of the vaginal canal um, and for revision of that stenosis. 
Um, another thing that patients might come to you with is say, hey, I've noticed um, some odor um, from my vagina. And, and that can is oftentimes due to the fact that because the neo vagina is not self-cleaning, patients do need to sort of perform some more active cleaning. Um, it's typically recommended at this time um, from the surgeons, as far as I can tell, that um, patients have some sort of either douching or cleansing in the shower three times a week indefinitely uh, post-operatively. Um, and so if folks are having um, a little bit of odor issues, they, it can just be recommended that they um, undergo a little bit of douching. However, if it's persistent or very severe, um, typically this is resolved with a five-day course of metronidazole. Um, so just something to have on our radar um, because this is uh, not uncommon for folks to see in the primary care setting. Um, uh, PO Metro. Um, and uh, uh, UTI is actually not uncommon postoperatively also. Um, and that's because now people have shorter urethras. And so patients who have undergone um, vaginoplasty should be thought of as having analog UTI risk um, as with people who were assigned female at birth. Um, as with all surgical interventions, granulation tissue and scarring can be a concern. Um, Rectovaginal fistulas can occur. This is also something to alert the surgeon about because nobody wants to have um, stool coming from their vagina. That's a very unfortunate complication and needs to typically be managed surgically. Um, and then an important thing to think about for these patients is that, again, you've used squamous tissue um, to line their vaginal canal. And so that means that they are at risk of skin cancer inside their vagina. Um, and so I'll talk to you a little bit about ways to mitigate uh, the risk of and monitor for that in just a second. So um, this is just slide is in place because I wanted to re-emphasize some of the things that will probably come up as a primary care provider. Um, and that is number one, dilation, dilation, dilation. Uh, these patients do need to dilate for a year minimum, sometimes longer, depending on surgical rec the surgeon's recommendations. Uh, they will typically be discharged with a dilator schedule um, that describes the frequency of dilation that's required and the size of the dilator that needs to be used um, and how long they need to dilate for daily. Um, obviously, this is pretty significant for patients who are three months post-op um, and are maybe returning to work to have to three times a day um, place a dilator. That can be pretty disruptive, and so that's something that um, that can sometimes uh, fall behind a little bit, understandably, or can be disruptive to patients' lives. Um, uh, douching, as I mentioned, is recommended three times a week indefinitely. Um, as far as screening and monitoring goes, it's really important for us to know that there's no firm guidelines around how often these patients need to undergo pelvic exams. Um, I've seen some surgeons recommend annual pelvic exams, which is quite a lot. Um, that might not be appropriate for every patient. Um, and that's certainly not a firm recommendation. That's just sort of what I've seen some surgeons recommend. And the goal of that is to sort of visualize and feel to see if there's any obvious lesions um, that might be concerning for a, a vaginal skin cancer. Um, but that's a little bit up to the discretion of the patient and the PCP. But one year is something that might be reasonable. Um, or rather annually, something that might be reasonable. And then again, don't forget the prostate. Um, because now uh, vagina is in situ, it's um, feeling the prostate through the rectum is sort of less easy to do. And so um, typically what's recommended is that when you are performing a pelvic exam, you just um, feel for the prostate endovaginally. Um, and that's usually pretty, pretty uh, easy to appreciate. Cam, a couple um, of questions in the chat, maybe you, you are seeing them. Um, one that just came up, why are we so worried about vaginal skin cancer, which is not routinely screened for per US, USPSTF for cis women? Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, surgery? that's a great question. And the reason is because it's not mucosal tissue, it's squamous cell tissue. So um, it's, and it's tissue that, you know, might have had sun exposure in the past and things like that. So it's just that it's not something that's on our radar for cisgender women because cisgender women typically don't get, you know, squamous cell carcinomas of their um, vaginal lining because they don't have squamous cell tissue there. So it's sort of the analog to um, like having concerned about, um, about like 
vulval or vaginal cancer uh, in your cisgender woman patient. Um, and then I can see the chat here. I can see anal prostate exams are not recommended. Is there something else that the surgeons want to look for? No, it's just that they are not up to date on the um, current screening recommendations. And so they usually discharge uh, the patients with recommendations to tell their PCP to check for their prostate and the vaginally. Um, and it's not something that you need to do annually. Um, but if they're, it's just important for us to remember that these patients typically do still have a prostate. And so um, sometimes that can be a common misconception. They can say, uh, or we can say, oh, this person has undergone um, a vaginoplasty. They've had bottom surgery. That means that they have no uh, uh, quote unquote male organs or um, organs that we typically associate with folks who are assigned male at birth. Um, and then we can forget about it. And obviously it's quite shocking and disturbing then for the patient to be discovered to have prostate cancer down the road. Um, not only is that awful for patients because they have cancer, but um, it's awful for patients because it can exacerbate gender dysphoria as well because it's a sort of gender non-aligning cancer. Um, so I think it's important to mention that this risk still remains um, so that we have it on our radar, not because I think that these patients need to undergo annual prostate exams. Does that answer questions? And is there anything else that I missed? There was one question, one other question um, earlier, how is the mm -hmm. hair removed pre-op? And then um, Juliet also offered laser and electrolysis are often used, but not covered. Uh, um, that is, that is very correct. Process. Laser and electrolysis are used and they are typically not covered. And I will talk with you guys a bit in just a second. I'm sorry that this is running a little bit long. Um, I'm going to uh, blaze through some other surgeries. Um, and then talk to you guys about the more practical components of the process. Um, facial feminization surgery, I will just talk with you guys about briefly. It's a, uh, as I mentioned, a form of craniofacial plastic surgery designed to minimize traditionally masculine features. And so that means typically advancing the hairline, um, contouring the forehead and orbital rim, um, uh, reducing the appearance of the Adam's apple, apple of, or the laryngeal prominence, potentially rhinoplasty, et cetera. Um, it's typically performed it, it, uh, in one, but can sometimes be a stage procedure with the upper face and the lower face. Um, I mention it here because this is a very important patient for some um, some people, excuse me, a very important intervention for some people because it can really help folks um, both feeling comfortable with their sort of gender congruence and making them feel safe. Um, so I, I hate to bring up things like passing um, because I think it's a very loaded term, but for patients who are visibly transgender it's in some parts of the world, that can really put them at increased risk. And so facial feminization surgery can be something that can really help improve their comfort level and their safety. Um, and I bring it up because it is sometimes dismissed as cosmetic um, and it's often not covered by insurance. Um, the recovery time for this procedure is typically three to four weeks, and complications include sensory loss, uh, problems with their sinuses, their um, frontal sinuses, their maxillary sinuses, their septal sinuses, um, and some changes to their um, nasal septum. Um, here are some photos of some before and after folks um, who shared their photos. Um, Preoperatively and postoperatively with facial feminization surgery. The last surgery that I'm going to briefly talk about today is um, vocal feminization surgery. Um, and I bring it up because estrogen does not change patient's voice pitch. And so that means that trans feminine individuals must either consciously train, train their voice um, by working with um, a speech therapist or undergo uh, vocal feminization surgery. Uh, there's a couple of different surgical options like glottoplasty or cricothyroid approximation. This is typically a well-tolerated surgery, um, but it can have some complications of a sort of vocal breathiness, vocal fatigue. It can have um, an impact on patient's singing voice. So sort of somebody who is an opera star uh, preoperatively might have a lot of concerns about going through this procedure. Um, and it's important to note that patients who have um, feminizing vocal surgery have to have complete vocal rest for 10 days, like complete vocal rest, like no coughing, no clearing your throat, no whispering. Um, and it can take up to a year for them to have full vocal recovery. Um, I strongly recommend um, 
these folks are referred to speech therapy, um, honestly, both pre and post-operatively, but post-operatively, it is really pretty imperative to prevent some of that breathiness and vocal fatigue. Um, and obviously we don't have control over whether or not our patients get intubated oftentimes, but if you can avoid elective procedures um, for three months, that would be great because you don't want to cause disruption to their um, new vocal cords. Um, and I have been planning to um, send you guys a, um, or show some before and afters of this voice surgery, but I'm running short on time. So I will just put a link in the chat for you guys to listen to afterwards. Um, so now I'm going to walk you guys through some of the practicals. Um, if you guys were here two weeks ago, you will remember our favorite transmasculine patient, Ash, who we have helped to take care of ever since they transitioned from their adolescent care. And we got them restarted back on HRT and talked to them about fertility preservation and all that stuff. Um, so Ash is now coming back to see you. Um, and uh, you last saw him a year ago for routine healthcare maintenance. He's been doing great. He hasn't had any concerns. At this visit, he's coming back to you because he tells you that he's been contemplating bottom surgery and he wants to know next steps and how he can help. I'm not going to dwell on this, but I put this up on the screen because I think that patient, uh, providers get very, very anxious about discussing you know, what organs people have, and that can sometimes lead to really awkward uh, or unpleasant conversations for both uh, the doc and the patient. So uh, I will just put in this plug. Now that we have reviewed all of the different forms of gender affirming surgery, you can go through their organ inventory simply by saying, what gender affirming surgeries have you had? And then once patients share what surgeries they have had or haven't had, that allows you to then sort of mentally transpose <laughs> their current anatomical uh, situation onto that. And so that can help to avoid a lot of anxiety about, you know, potentially triggering gender dysphoria um, or, you know, putting your foot in your mouth a little bit when it comes to going through the organ inventory. So a little script for you here, um, you could say, what gender affirming surgeries have you had? And Ash might reply, well, I had top surgery in San Francisco in 2020. I haven't had bottom surgery, but I've been thinking about phalloplasty. And you note that they didn't explicitly mention hysterectomy, and you're not sure maybe if a hysterectomy and or ophorectomy are included in what they mean by bottom surgery. So you just ask them explicitly, have you had a hysterectomy? Um, and Ash says, yeah, I did. I had um, my uterus taken out, but I left one of my ovaries just in case I wanted to have kids. Um, and if he hadn't explicitly clarified that about the ovaries, you could ask, have, they, have you had an ophorectomy or, or have, your, have you left their ovaries in place. That's perfectly acceptable. Um, and so now you know that they no longer have breast tissue, they no longer have a uterus or cervix, uh, they do have one ovary, um, and they still have, um, or he still has, his vaginal canal and his vulva at this time. So now you need to get this referral process going for poor Ash and for poor you, because it can be something of an arduous process. Number one, two, and three here, ask the patient who they would like to see. Uh, these patients are typically extremely well-educated about the various providers that offer the procedures that they would like and what procedures they would like specifically. They are not going to be leaning on you typically to know what um, providers are available. Um, be aware that choices in Washington are quite limited. Um, in the state of uh, Washington, there are about 15 people who provide uh, top surgery, both masculinizing and feminizing. So that includes people who perform breast augmentation. Um, in, and are open to doing so in transgender patients. Um, here within our system, the two people to be aware of are Dr. Russell Enger, who practices at Harborview, and Dr. Shane Morrison, who is at Children's. Um, of those 15 people, about half of them will accept Medicare or Medicaid. Um, and it can be a little bit of legwork on the patient's part to figure out who. Um, there is only one person who performs bottom surgery in the state of Washington, and uh, they are in Spokane, and they exclusively perform vaginoplasty. Um, so all patients who want to undergo either phalloplasty or metoidioplasty must be referred out of state. Um, the nearest is OHSU. Um, and I'm really, really excited to tell you that that might change in the upcoming future um, because one of our urologists, Dr. Alexander Skoken, um, is considering offering uh, phalloplasty for transmasculine individuals, uh, but that is not something that's up and running yet. I would anticipate that it might be so in the upcoming um, months. I'm, I'm really, really hopeful about that. Um, 
And um, that would obviously be a, a very positive change for some of our patients. Although the potential consequence of that is that um, for, uh, there's a lot of insurance issues in getting these things covered, um, anticipate a battle, patients should anticipate Anticipate a battle, but one thing is that it's now pretty easy to apply for an out-of-state exemption for patients to see their provider of choice because there are few providers in state. Um, and now, if there is a provider in state, that might get a little stinky from an insurance point of view. But still, it'll be great. Um, uh, if your patients would like to undergo facial feminization surgery at UW, um, you can refer them to Dr. Ettinger as well. Um, this is a, a more accessible procedure for many people because a lot of folks who just perform plastic surgery, uh, craniofacial plastic surgery on all individuals um, will also perform sort of feminizing um, surgery on transgender folks. It's not really trans specific. So the one thing that you will encounter if you have not encountered already is something called letters of support. Um, letters of support um, are a pre-operative requirement, um, and they come from both primary care physicians and mental health providers. Um, historically, this was like a huge, huge barrier to both HRT and surgery. Um, huge barrier still is, there's a lot of arguments about gatekeeping here, um, but basically you ha will have to write a letter as a PCP saying that you think it's appropriate for this patient to undergo surgery, both medically and because you think that they have gender dysphoria, so you have to give them the sign off. Uh, behavioral health providers have to do so as well. So you will likely need to write a letter like this and help a patient find a behavioral health provider who will help them write this letter. Um, I strongly recommend either referring them to Psychology Today, as you do with many folks who need um, access to mental health, um, and you can have them filter by transgender, um, and that will sometimes give them access to folks who are writing letters. Um, there's also a, a program called Gallup, um, uh, that's at thegallop.org, which is a group of providers who have gotten together to say, hey, we sort of um, ideologically oppose this and we will write a letter for anyone for free. Um, but as you might imagine, they are very busy. And so um, while it's something that you could share with your patients, it's not always an option. Um, please do be aware that a new letter is required for every single procedure. So you might write a letter for somebody for their top surgery and then have to write a letter for them for their bottom surgery. Um, for top surgery, you need a letter from a behavioral health provider at, and oftentimes a letter from a PCP as well. For bottom surgery, they need two behavioral health letters, including one from a behavioral health provider who has a PhD. Specifically, don't ask me why that is, but that is a, usually a very firm requirement, as well as a PCP letter. Um, the requirements of the letter um, are that you must say who you are, say your relationship to the patient, describe the patient in terms of their age, their gender, their medical comorbidities, emphasize that they have a gender dysphoria diagnosis, um, talk about the medical necessity and the appropriateness of the procedure, both again to address the gender dysphoria and to whether or not you feel that it's medically appropriate them, for them to undergo a surgical intervention. You do also um, have to talk about their mental health and the presence or absence of substance use disorders or uh, housing instability. It's not a, um, a strict or contraindication uh, to gender affirming surgery to have a history of mental health issues or have a history of substance use disorders or have a history of housing instability. But um, if patients are actively undergoing those issues, the surgeon might decline to perform a surgery at that time um, with the argument that like they will, the recovery, particularly for bottom surgery might be complex and they might not be able to um, sort of follow through with the follow-up or, or it might be too disruptive to their lives or the risk of complications might be too high. Um, surgeons also ask that you comment on the duration of their HRT in this, in this uh, letter. So here is an example letter uh, that I'll just briefly put up on the screen. Um, if you are a member of the transgender uh, care and transgender allies listserv, there's many examples of these letters. I also um, would recommend reaching out to the UCSF transgender their website, where under the providers page, there are some examples of provider letters um, that are pretty easily accessible and that you can search for if you are writing a letter for a patient yourself. Um, I'm almost done, I promise guys, thank you for bearing with me. Um, um, oh shoot, I'm sorry, I, the chat has now popped up 
full screen. Okay, there we go. Some common bottlenecks that I'd like to emphasize for you guys. Um, access issues are unfortunately extremely common due to the limited number of providers. Um, historically, this has been years and years and years, and even still, I would expect wait times of between six months and one and a half years for top surgery, and um, between six months and up to three years for bottom surgery. Um, so obviously that can be pretty considerable for patients who are um, who have been waiting for this for a very long time. The costs are considerable. Um, increasingly, um, now that some of the, so like if you go back five years, um, there was oftentimes blanket exceptions or blanket exclusions for transgender patients for accessing transgender related care when it comes to their insurance, um, which was really lousy. So like anyone who is transgender would be unable to get coverage for their HRT or for their surgeries inherently. Um, that is now uh, not allowed, thank God. Um, and so increasingly uh, surgical interventions are covered but they might not be fully covered. There's a lot of legwork involved um, and they're patients can be caught out at every turn. So um, there's oftentimes a, a huge out-of-pocket cost burden and that can be really limiting. Um, for top surgery, we're looking at up to 10K for both feminizing and masculinizing top surgery. Metoidioplasty, up to $40,000. Phalloplasty, $150,000. Vaginoplasty, 100 or really up to 150. Um, and then for um, the, these craniofacial surgeries, again, up to $100,000. And these are very rarely covered by insurance because of the argument that it's purely cosmetic. And that doesn't even factor in things like travel, accommodation, caregiving, medical supplies, their operative, uh, post-operative medications. And the fact that many of these people um, are not able to work for two months post-operatively and might have a loss of income there. So uh, that's that can be really huge and something that patients might voice distress about to you. And I just think that people should be aware of. Um, also some common bottlenecks are these BMI requirements that I mentioned previously because if a patient is heavy set, they might have to lose a fair bit of weight um, prior to being considered for um, surgery and for bottom surgery specifically. And then also um, in uh, phalloplasty sp specifically, but in many forms of uh, gender affirming surgery, um, Surgeons are very hesitant about tobacco use leading to sort of poor outcomes um, due to sort of like thrombus formation. And so um, many surgeons will not perform uh, gender affirming surgery on um, patients who are actively smoking. And that can be uh, really burdensome too because there's a lot of tobacco use within the transgender community. Um, and so while this can be a good motivation to quit, it can also be a barrier. Um, to talk about hair removal, and I'll just fly through this, but it's very important preoperatively for people who are undergoing one phalloplasty and two vaginoplasty. It can also come up in other forms of surgery as well, but it's really essential for those two techniques. Um, it's, I would say that most commonly for phalloplasty, I've seen surgeons say, please only do electrolysis, although rarely uh, laser is acceptable. Uh, for vaginoplasty, again, it is electrolysis or laser. The surgeon Surgeons will usually tell the patients very clearly where they need to have the hair removed. For foul plastic, it's on the donor site, be it their arm, their leg, their back. For vaginoplasty, it's the genitals or and the uh, perineum. You can see my sort of like crude diagram, excuse me, that I took from a surgical site on the left. Uh, hair removal can be painful. Your patient might come to you and say, hey, can I please have some topical lidocaine? And I would encourage you to grant them that. Um, and getting coverage for that from an insurance point of view is insanely annoying. Just a huge care gap and a huge problem for many patients. Um, does insurance cover it? Sometimes, yes, maybe, um, but expect a fight. You might have to write a letter of support for this too. Almost no one takes Medicare or Medicaid. Um, the only place I have ever encountered that has good luck with that um, is Queen Anne Medical Associates. And so they're my new favorite people um, because they, they accept a lot of forms of health insurance and also have a lot of experience working with a sort of gender diverse community. And so um, I've heard patients say that they feel very safe. So not to like plug a specific place, but I think that that's one group to potentially refer to. Um, I have never heard of anyone getting uh, coverage when they have TRICARE or seen through the VA, which is again, just uniquely aggravating, but um, it is what it is at the moment. Um, hopefully that will improve in upcoming days. Recovery planning for patients who undergo surgery requires a lot of thoughtfulness. Patients need to think about um, their, how much time they're taking off work, if 
um, how close they are to the surgeon, if they need to travel, if they need to have a caregiver with them or hire a caregiver to help take care of them in the immediate post-op setting. Um, patients are usually aware of this um, and very, very careful, but um, it's sort of meaningful for us to know as their PCP. Um, and the anticipated timelines for this, for patients who, um, you can see it here typed out, but briefly top surgery, expect that they will need two weeks of rest and eight weeks um, particularly with uh, double incision uh, masculinizing top surgery without lifting heavy objects or lifting their arms above their head. Uh, the reason for that is because if you have inframammary incisions, you can um, increase your, your scarring if you're lifting your arms. Um, so you might have to help them undergo FMLA leave for between two to eight weeks. And um, I have had pretty good luck getting that sort of covered. Um, for people who undergo bottom surgery, these people really need a minimum of eight weeks off of work. Um, I have seen folks try to bargain with their um, with their bottom surgeons to say, hey, can I do six weeks? And usually the answer is a pretty firm no, particularly for people who undergo metoidoplasty or phalloplasty, who might need to have a month with a suprapubic catheter and oftentimes need to have like a second stage procedure. Um, in vaginoplasty, there's no suprapubic, so at least that isn't a, bar a barrier. Um, but um, really it's very hard for folks to get back into the group of things prior to eight weeks. And for phalloplasty specifically, post-operative complications are really pretty common. Um, and so they might need even longer than eight weeks. And so again, um, be thinking about um, helping these folks with FMLA leave. This is my last slide. And it's just a summary of the things that I anticipate will be deferred to you as the PCP. Things like helping them get set up and get these letters written, helping them with weight loss and with smoking sensation preoperatively, um, making recommendations about scar care, um, which is the same in gender affirming surgery as any patient who would come to you with scarring. And so it's things like silicone, massaging, moisturization, referring to dermatology, um, helping folks get involved with physical therapy postoperatively, um, particularly people who have undergone phalloplasty and might need to undergo donor site PT, um, managing minor postoperative complications, tweaking their HRT regimen postoperatively, and specifically I'm thinking about orchiectomy here and stopping their testosterone, performing routine cancer screening and pelvic exams at an appropriate interval, um, and then just follow up because again, most of these folks are out of state. And so um, the recommendation from many surgeons is that if they're not local, that they follow up with their PCP um, at the three month mark and at the six month mark after they've undergone bottom surgery. Um, which can be challenging for us because, you know, we are not experts in bottom surgery and, and having an awareness of these complications can be challenging. So um, the big takeaway here is when in doubt, um, call the surgeon and tell them that they, <laughs> they need to help us and, and, uh, and give us a little bit of guidance with these patients. I'm going to leave these resources up on the screen and say thank you so much for uh, putting up with me, even though this talk ran much longer than I, I thought. Um, and I'm sure there's questions that I missed in the chat. I'll just highlight two that I saw. One was, yeah. have you had luck getting FMLA for recovery time? I have had luck getting FMLA for recovery time, thankfully. Um, obviously a variable, but um, I usually just emphasize that this is post-operative recovery and then that was okay in the circumstances that I've done that. And then another question is, what age of patients will Dr. Morrison see at Children's? What is the upper age limit? I'm not 100% sure, but I typically think of like up to 25. Um, but I am unfortunately uh, not certain on that. Any, anything else, guys? I know that was sort of a whirlwind tour and, and a lot to cover. Um, I hope it was a little bit informative, at least, since I think this is something that um, can be totally befuddling uh, when patients come to you saying, hey, I need a letter. And it's like, I don't know what this is. I've never heard of that. And I'm feeling quite overwhelmed. All right. If there's no other questions, hopefully I can set you guys free. Oh, and let me really quick, I'm going to end my... Um, end my, uh, my screen share here. And I'm going to link you guys to this video um, of a person who has undergone uh, vocal feminization surgery. It's just one minute long. And I think that it can be uh, really nicely demonstrative of, um, of how effective this technique can be.
Thanks so much, Cam. Thank you guys. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, obviously, you know email addresses, so feel free to send our speakers any follow-up questions. Um, there's a lot of chat about how to get on the Trans Health Allies listserv, which I think um, Julie already posted uh, Corinne Heinen's email address. Um, and you can also email Sean Johnson, who is a program operations specialist for the um, network that's starting at UW. Um, okay, so with that, why don't we sign off and we'll see you next Thursday. Thanks for your attention.